Well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this, the third of OBC's uh, series of webinars. Uh, my name is Chris Goody. I'm the current OBC chairman, and I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everybody, especially to everyone in the region. Uh, it's great to have this webinar Zoom format uh, where we can uh, make everyone feel more involved with OBC uh, relative to uh, just having physical meetings within the UK. Uh, there are lots of benefits of being an OBC member, of course. If you're not an OBC member yet and you'd like to join OBC, all you have to do is go to orientalbirdclub.org forward slash join and you can join us immediately. You'll be very welcome. We do rely on memberships and donations from members. We're a voluntary organisation. That means every pound you spend with OBC goes directly to conservation. If you'd like to make a donation, you can do that too. Um, OBC needs funds more than ever. We've more than tripled our spend on conservation this year compared to previous years. Uh, so if you'd like to make a donation again, it's just orientalbirdclub.org forward slash donate. That will take you directly via the donate button to give money to OBC. That will help both Black Brow Babbler and of course, um, general, uh, OBC conservation projects generally in the region. Even just five pounds or 10 pounds, five euros or 10 euros is invaluable to OBC. So please do um, contribute and donate if you can. Um, Today's webinar covers the thrilling story of the rediscovery of Black Browed Babbler um, after many years in the wilderness. Uh, I'm going to quote directly from OBC's own Journal of Asian Ornithology, what used to be called Forktail. For 172 years since its initial discovery, probably around 1848, the Black Browed Babbler, uh, Malacca Sinclair perspicillata, has eluded attempts by researchers at its rediscovery, and the species is often regarded as among the biggest enigmas in Indonesian ornithology. In short, this is the bird that's gone missing for a longer time than any other bird, including, for example, such illustrious company as uh, Ivory Bill Woodpecker. Um, the babbler was in, indeed treated as extinct by some authorities. For example, Clements in 2000 thought it was probably extinct. Now we know, of course, happily that's not the case. I'm excited to say our main speaker today is one of the key figures in the story of the rediscovery of Black Brown Babbler, Panji Gusti Akbar. Um, but just before we hear from Panji, I'm first going to hand over to Paul Insuakawa, who is OBC's Chair of Conservation, uh, to say a few words. So, Paul, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. So, I'm just going to um, share a couple of slides with you um, and just give a little bit of background about the OBC's conservation programme and particularly our support for projects in, in Indonesia. I'm just gonna share a screen with you right now. Um, so the OBC has been increasing our funding support for conservation projects uh, within that Asia region. Uh, we support projects for bird conservation throughout Asia. And to date about, um, or over half a million pounds has been donated to, to projects supporting bird conservation. So our, our grant programme is run entirely by volunteers who are all very, very knowledgeable um, about the countries of the region. And for that reason, we have no admin costs. So all of your donations will go directly to these conservation projects. Um, and for those of you interested in accessing grants, um, more information can be found on the OBC website orientalbirdclub.org. Um, now, of all the countries in Asia, Indonesia tends to receive the most grants, and that's not just because of personal whims or interests of individuals within the OBC, uh, but I think there's a good justification for that. And my next slide is going to um, sort of bring that, bring that to light. This um, I've taken from the website of Burung Indonesia. Burung Indonesia is the bird life partner in, in Indonesia, of course. Um, and we have a collaboration with both BirdLife and Burung Indonesia. Um, and I think it's a very uh, attractive slide that, that catches everything um, very uh, attractively. So the thing I'd like to bring your attention to is um, there's something like 1,800 species of birds in Indonesia, making it one of the most bird diverse countries in the world. Uh, and it's, uh, it's right there, up there in the Champions League of, of bird diverse countries. Um, and in the semi-finals alongside Peru, uh, Brazil and Colombia, and uh, has by, hard, by far the highest bird diversity of any country in Asia. 
So that's one reason why um, why Indonesia would be receiving a lot of grants from OBC. But I'd like to draw your attention to this. Um, and for those of you who don't read um, Bahasa, that, that says uh, the number of birds that are either critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable to extinction uh, globally, uh, according to BirdLife and the IUCN. And there's something like 180 different species making um, about 10% of the, uh, the, the bird diversity of Indonesia, which, which brings to um, brings the point that Indonesia is a really important country for, for funding bird conservation and justifies somewhat the fact that it's receiving more, more grants than any other country within the Asia region. But that's not to say there are not other important projects in other Asian countries. So the next slide I'm going to show you gives you an indication of what the priorities are for, for OBC in terms of where it puts its funding. And these are, these are priorities, they're not exclusive, um, but it does help us to, to sort of strategically target where our funding goes. Uh, most of the projects that we fund tick more than one of these priorities. And I'm not gonna go through all the priorities here. Uh, you can find more information on the OBC website. So first and most obviously, we prioritize globally threatened birds, uh, birds that are threatened with extinction, and critically or critically endangered or endangered. And one of, example of that in Indonesia is our project that we're supporting for the Christmas frigate bird uh, in Jakarta Bay. That's run by Seabirds Indonesia. Um, another priority is migratory shorebirds. Uh, another one is birds that are threatened by trade and especially songbirds. And we know this is a really important issue in, in Indonesia. Um, some examples of those projects that we're funding are surveys for the Javan Green Magpie, um, uh, a project for conservation of barley starling that's run by Friends of National Parks. And we have been supporting the Chikananga Breeding Centre um, for their work on conservation breeding of uh, some of these uh, threatened songbird species. Another sort of clear priority is actually supporting direct conservation action on the ground. Um, so, and especially those that engage local communities, because we know that uh, in situ conservation on the ground requires, at the, at the end of the day, to be sustainable, it requires support from local stakeholders. So some examples of our projects in Indonesia include uh, a project near Yogyakarta at Jatimolyo village, uh, a project that involves the uh, Javan uh, hill flycatcher as a flagship species. Uh, we have a, a project we're supporting on uh, Bankaru Island off the coast of Sumatra that's, that's led by uh, Ecosystem Impact and doing a really good job of, of patrolling habitats there. Um, and another project on the the Bangai Crow in uh, Sulawesi that's led by Mochamed Indrawan. There's, there's just a few, a few of the examples of those direct conservation action projects uh, that we're supporting. Uh, we also fund projects that um, encourage public appreciation of wild birds and nature. So for example, there's a project um, currently under, underway in Bandung City in Western Java that's about encouraging people to uh, appreciate wild birds in the city as a kind of antidote um, against uh, the, the strong interest in, in cage birds in, in Indonesia. Uh, we obviously prioritize projects that are run by individuals or organizations from the country uh, that the, the project is being implemented in. And last but not least, um, we particularly are interested in supporting projects for, for birds that are really just poorly known. And that brings us to the topic of, of today's webinar and the, uh, the Black Brow, Brow Babbler, which was so poorly known um, for 172 years, as Chris mentioned there, it hadn't been recorded. And really very little was known about its ecology. So uh, uh, OBC, in uh, collaboration with the American Bird Conservancy, I'm really sort of proud to, to fund this project that's being led by um, 
by Panji here. Now, I should also mention the March Conservation Fund, which has been supporting OBC and, and funds from that we've been uh, channeling towards this project as well. So that's, that's enough from me. Um, please visit the OBC website to find out more and I'll hand back to, to Chris and then on to Panji. Brilliant, thanks for that, Paul. Uh, some great stuff there. Hopefully it gives you a, a flavor of some of the stuff that um, OBC has been doing. Um, I, you may be aware already, we've, we've more than tripled our spending on conservation in the last two years. A lot of stuff um, as a result of the pandemic and for other reasons has meant we've needed to accelerate that. So if you can spare any money to us, please do uh, go to orientalbeerclub.org forward slash donate. All donations welcome. So our main speaker today uh, is Panji Gusti Akbar. Um, Panji is one of the authors of the paper outlining the rediscovery of Black Brow Babbler um, in the OBC's Journal of Asian Ornithology, which was published in late 2021. Uh, Panji is a birder. He's native to Indonesia, based in Yogyakarta, um, currently working in citizen science and with the conservation-based NGO uh, Birdpacker Indonesia. In October 2020, he was contacted by a fellow birder regarding a strange bird that their colleagues had found deep in the Bornean, Bornean forest. That bird, of course, turned out to be a long lost black browed babbler. So I'll shut up now and hand over to Panji to tell us a story of the rediscovery of the black browed babbler. Panji, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, let me go to the presentation for a while. Okay. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, OBC, for organizing this awesome webinar so I can share some of my story about my study of the black browed babbler today. Um, so as everyone already knows, my name is Panji, and I'm so lucky to take part in this uh, discovery of long lost species. And today we will be discussing a little story about how the species was brought back into the lack of science after being hidden for almost two centuries, and some stuff that I and my team learned while studying this bird in the wild. Uh, so before we start, I would like to tell a bit of story about my organization, which is Bird Packer. Uh, some of you might already know us. You already know us as bird watching tour company, but we are currently and officially becoming an NGO focusing on citizen science based movement for bird conservation. One of our pilot project is Burungnesia, which is a voluntary based app to collect checklists for bird sightings all around Indonesia, and it has been running since 2016. Now we already collected uh, 32,000 checklists uh, submitted by more than 200, uh, I mean, 2,000 registered users all around Indonesia. And the data that we collected has been used for several research and conservation projects, both by ourselves and by third parties, including the Atlas Book Indonesia or the Indonesian Bird Atlas, um, which cover two thirds of every single bird species in Indonesia. Now into the main event. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone here already knows about the black belt bubbler uh, and what made this bird so special. But for the sake of context, let me tell just a short recap regarding the Babbler, uh, regarding the natural history of the black bear babbler prior to it was discovered in 2020. So the black bear babbler was discovered somewhere. We will go back into it in a minute, but somewhere in Indonesia by a renowned naturalist called Alam Schwanners, uh, who procured a single specimen between 1843 to 1848. Uh, little did he know that that will also be the last time the bubble was seen alive by the scientific community, which means it wasn't seen for more than 172 years. Now, just to give you some idea how long ago it was, by the time Schwanner worked the specimen, a uh, passenger pigeon, which is now extinct, can still be seen flying in flock over American skies, and the origin of species by Charles Darwin hasn't even been published yet. Uh, the specimen was then described by Charles Lucien Bonaparte, or the nephew of the famous Napoleon Bonaparte, in 1850. Uh, and by the time Bonaparte mentioned the type locality to be Java, perhaps due to mislabeling, which is a common mistake at the time. Uh, this mistake went rather unnoticed until Johann Butikoffer in 1895. Uh, he <clears throat> he corrected the type specimen to be from Borneo under the fact that Schwano had only collected the specimens in that island. Uh, later, J. of Mies in 1995 specified that the specimen might be collected in South Kalimantan, particularly around two big cities there, Banjarmasin and Matapura, where this bird has been mapped ever since. 
Um, due to the absence of citing several authors that provide suspicion of extinction, uh, while others explicitly categorize it as extinct, like what Paul already said, uh, climate checklist in 2007, 2007 uh, categorize it as extinct. However, the IUCN whitelist, which is the classification system that many scientists refer to when talking about threatened species, has never listed this species as extinct. In fact, it was only treated as threatened in, in 1988 and then vulnerable in 1994 before being changed into data deficient in 2008 until now due to the lack of research to prove its actual status in the world. Uh, I would like to note that there are more publications regarding the species natural history, which sadly I cannot explain to really do this time, but I recommend the audience to read the excellent publication written by Nigel Collar in 2014, which summarized the overall se century long publication of this species, especially getting its taxonomy, possible ecology, behavior, and etc. What needs to be noted that most of these publications are based solely on assumptions or analysis of the original specimens, which might not be conclusive and can only be confirmed by observation in its native habitat. Uh, the question is where we can find them or even is it still possible for us to find them? Um, luckily, luckily in 2020, uh, deep in the heart of Borneo, two men, two local men, Muhammad Suwanto and Muhammad Rizki Fauzan, uh, which have a slightly different way to appreciate the birds than us, if you know what I mean, managed to catch the bird that they have seen for a while, but they never know its name. Uh, they asked some agriculturists regarding the bird's ID and the picture of this bird uh, has been circulated among the community for quite a while until it ended up in agriculturists and birding group BW Galeatus into some uh, college of mine and eventually to me. Um, the moment I noticed the pictures, uh, we just realized that it just it looks fairly similar to the black ball bubblers, uh, which have been missing for quite a while. So we try to uh, compare it to the specimen pictures from the Naturalist Biodiversity Center in Leiden, in Leiden, Netherlands, and find a very amazing similarity except for two things. Uh, can you see it? The eyes. Uh, the eyes and the bill and also the leg color probably. Um, later on, after we checked with Mr. Color Peppers about the bubblers, we learned how the Alice color was actually never been explicitly, explicitly described. And that the, we also found out that the specimen, the, 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 the skin color of the specimens, particularly around the bill or the leg may actually change over time. So um, this is probably the reason why it looks kind of different from the specimen uh, the original specimens from AT48. Um, we also confirmed that uh, there are no other birds in uh, Borneo that have similar head patterns as the, the one that being discovered by uh, Muhammad Suwanto, except for the black bulb bubblers. I mean, there are several other species of bird that have bolt marking like gray chested bubblers or the light wind bubblers, but nothing similar like this. Uh, we quickly contact Masuanto uh, and ask him to get more pictures as well as, as well as some facts about the bird that he knew, like where he called it, some K behavior, and etc. And since no one, since there are no one with bird handling training was present at the site, uh, we did not want to risk harming the bird, which at the time might actually be the last one of its population. So we decided to not get any morphometric measurements or any other sample and request. Uh, Masuanto to release the bird ASAP, which he did. Uh, we still get some better pictures with scale, hence you see the pictures of the bird with some money here, as well as some key identification feature to confirm its ID and some of its behavior. Uh, Suanto also managed to get recording of this bird during short captive time, which proven to be extremely important to our study later. So this is the a uh, map of the rediscovery uh, locations. Um, so it was talked in the Kota Bayu Regency in Kalimantan Selatan, which confirmed uh, that it indeed exists in South Kalimantan as mentioned by Jell of Mies, albeit maybe a little bit further away from his original uh, prediction, which is around Banjarmas in Matapura, and also a bit far away from uh, Sultan Adam Forest Park here and Palaihari Wildlife Reserves, which is 
uh, the place where BirdLife International predicted it to be to exist. Uh, more specifically, it was called on the storage of low limestone hill formation uh, in the Muratus range, which made us wonder if the bird is actually a cast specialist, which is aware but not unheard threat of some birds in Southeast Asia. So if it was confirmed, spoiler alert, it is, this is going to be the first cast specialist bird in Indonesia. And it might also explain the absence of this bird from scientific knowledge for almost two centuries since this habitat is rarely studied. Um, so the publications, we wrote all these new facts into two publications that you might have already heard, uh, both in OBC's own journal, Birding Asia, and also the Journal of Asian Ornithology, which is uh, formerly known as Folktale. We also got some help from American Bird Conservancy and uh, Global Wildlife Conservation to make a worldwide news release regarding the sightings, which might be where most of the audience here heard about the bubblers. Um, in short, the story become uh, quite a sensation um, uh, during the lockdown world and uh, spark hope for all the long lost species that might still be hiding somewhere in there. So we finally found the birds, but what does it mean to the scientific knowledge of the species? Well, the first and foremost is that we know that it still exists and we have rough idea where it lives. We know that it inhabits Coast Hill to the east of Matus Range. And we know very well that it has red eye and not yellow as the fake eyes used by the Muslim specimens. We also finally got some recordings of its call and possible song, which I will explain in a minute. And, uh, and however, this finding also raised more questions that have been answered. Uh, we know they live in this spot where Suwanto and Fauzen found the bird, but do they live as well too? Do they only occupy the cause habitat as we have expected? Or is it just coincidence they found it there and the bubble actually occupies a wider type of habitat as well? Lastly, we know that they still exist right now, but how long they will still existing? Is there any threat to these populations? And how can we keep them from extinctions? Um, in short, the germ is not done yet. If, if, even after we managed to rediscover the birds. And there are so many things that we need to dig out from the species. And that's where we come to the expedition that me and my team did uh, some couple of months ago. Uh, so we devised a plan to visit the, the discovery location and find out more about this bird, which proven to be quite difficult in this strange time we live in. Uh, luckily, we have amazing support and funding from Oriental Bird Club and American Bird Conservancy. Which, are, which we are very lucky to get. Uh, the funding from ABC particularly come from uh, the March Conservation Fund, uh, which came from uh, your support as a member or, or as a donator. So please donate to the link provided to support other bird research conservation project in Asia. Uh, we also partnered with uh, BKS DL Kalimantan Selatan, which is the uh, conservation nature Natural Research Conservation Agency of South Kalimantan Province and the Forestry Office of South Kalimantan Province, of whom we are very thankful for smoothing out all the bureaucracies that we need to go to in order to visit the site during the pandemic. So the expedition was aimed to answer the most important questions after the rediscovery, which is uh, to find out the range limit of the bubbler, maybe trying to figure out a rough idea how well it is in terms of population, figuring out if there is an imminent threat uh, to the habitat and to the population as well, as well as collect useful behavioral and ecological data along the way. So basically, we're just trying to take a bit of data from every aspect of the bubble's life in order to establish a baseline data so that we can use it for a more targeted survey in the future. Um, there are several methods that we use to meet this goal, uh, which can be described in which can be described in these fancy words, but honestly, all we did was just walk randomly, well, a bit systematically and try to cover as many habitats as possible and collect as many sectings as possible, while occasionally blasting flyback in limited measure to lure the birds in, which proven to be quite important later on. Uh, we also utilize passive acoustic monitoring device to find more present points in some difficult to reach areas which are proven to be far too many in this rugged right terrain. While this may sound very simplistic, uh, we believe that this is the best way to extract as much data as possible from the species that we have fairly limited knowledge of before, uh, of which almost every single second of encounter may contain new information for the science. 
uh, the expedition was originally planned to run from July to August, but due to some circumstances regarding the COVID-19, it has to be postponed all the way from October to December 2021. So it's, it's fresh from the field. Uh, the study was mainly done around the original discovery site to the east of Matus Range. But uh, along the way, we also got some more information. Uh, we got some of the information of possible suitable habitat on this on the side of Moratus and decided to spend a little bit of time in the area. We we also covered various habitat ranging from hill and lowland primary forest, together forest, mangrove, plantation, and estra to ensure the habitat preference of this bubbler and confirm to our suspicion if they are truly a cause specialist. Next. And on to the result. Um, I have to remind the audience here that this is not the final result yet, since some fine tuning is still needed for the analysis. But here are some incredible facts that I and my team found to of the expedition. Um, the first, the occurrence. So during the span of two months, we managed to collect a total of 37 present points, uh, consisting of 31 reason present points, which we collected through direct observation using playback and using uh, passive and acoustic monitoring as well as six historical present points from the interviews. Uh, our present points lies within the area of interest uh, around the original discovery site. Uh, I will show the map uh, in a while. While none of this bubble was seen in any other site of Matus range, which suggests a high level of endemism of this bird. Uh, all the 24 settings were also recorded in various type of forests, ranging from degraded, secondary, uh, degraded forest, secondary forest, and primary forest. But all of these habitats shares one important feature, it is located on the Karst Hill Formation. So every single sighting here was recorded within less than 100 meters away from any exposed Karst Cliff, even though we carved relatively good and similar habitat nearby, possibly confirming our suspicion that they are highly specialized to Karst habitat. I have to note that um, while we also tried to use this and something during our survey to find out the density, it turned out to be very difficult since distance sampling requires us to not uh, the object's original distance from the observer without any interference. Uh, also, we call the organic sighting. And the usage of a playback will ruin the analysis. Uh, in our case, we never managed to get any single organic sighting without playback during the span of two months, perhaps due to the shy nature of this bird. So um, here are the maps and the point. So basically the purple is absence while green is present. We can see how the bubbler was only seen in this tiny area. Uh, let me turn on the laser for a bit. In this tiny area to the east of Matus Range where there lies an extensive cross formation that was not present on the other side of the range. Uh, so uh, the, the cross formation that I mentioned it only exists here, probably extend all the way here. Um, while the modeling is still underway, we can predict that the bubble may actually be endemic to only this tiny little area from, from, from here to here, um, where the cast formation exists. And uh, it's some, it's between, basically the whole area is less than 2000 kilometers per hour. So uh, this might actually, automatically putting them under the threatened category in IUCN, despite some population, uh, despite how, how many of their population are. So maybe for Norway, but please don't quote me on this yet since the analysis is still underway. Um, and this is the pictures of the typical habitat of the bubblers. Uh, so as you can see, they seemingly love this kind of like cliffs with uh, crevices and caves wrapped in Liana where they usually climb and find prey and sometimes also exploring the cave itself to try to find more prey. Uh, some of the some of the location were pristine primary forest, but uh, most of the location that we find the bubbler were somewhat disturbed secondary forest that has been burned at least once. This kind of show their tolerance to disturbance to some degree, as long as there are so there are still some undergrowth remaining in the area. Uh, we saw two, which is a little bit more exciting, I guess, about behavior. Uh, so generally, they are, they are not really big surprise as most of the behavior of the bubbler is 
they it just resembles or the Malakoking Club bubble or or the general Babel family or the Babel general in, in general. Apart from the fact that um, it apart from the fact that um, they they associate a lot with the rocky rugged trends of the Cause Hill, so they are usually active mainly in the lower story and occasionally in sick metals above the ground. So. And they're also very focal, especially in the morning and after after the duet between pairs. Uh, basically, we managed to get 19 voice recordings, including uh, uh, three types of songs, uh, two types of duets, and, uh, and also some call and alarm calls. Um, we also encountered some feeding behavior, few of which we were able to identify the, pre the, the prey items, which includes aphids, uh, some snails, and also cockroach which they get either by leaf cleaning or plucking the, the prey strike from the ground. Uh, perhaps the most important finding is the possible breeding activity, which actually doesn't, it doesn't confirm any breeding, but makes, I guess, an important period of which we can focus to find uh, the, the breeding activity in the future research. Uh, so basically during the first half of the survey, uh, we always encounter the birds in pairs and they are always responding to the playback together. And they are very aggressive until we turn off the playback. However, during the second half, we suddenly only get single bird doing our encounter, uh, even in places where we know there are, there are pairs before. So it suggests that maybe the second bird is currently incubating the egg or that the season is actually over and the pair broke up. Uh, we also uh, saw a pair of this bubbler being followed by a plaintiff cuckoo, an immature plaintiff cuckoo, which seemingly associate with them, which suggests, suggests some bird parasite action thing from the cuckoo, but uh, since we we only encountered them for a while, we didn't see any feeding, so um, we were not able to confirm our suspicion, but there's a possibility that they are being parasitized by plaintiff cuckoo. Uh, next. Okay, um, uh, hopefully I can play this. So this is the, how to play it, come on. So here is a sample of duetting behavior between the bubblers. I hope everyone can hear how loud they are. are. So we assume that uh, the more melodious one is the male and the repetitive tit -tit 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 came from the female as in other bubblers. Uh, this is not a big surprise as this behavior has been known in many other bubblers, but it's still interestingly, uh, it's still interesting because we never know how this sounds like before. I uh, also just want to let everyone know that I never shared this song before. So every audience in this webinar, actually one of the first 500 people to ever hear this bird singing in natural habitat. So congratulations. Okay. Next one. Uh, another example of the behavior, which I found interesting. So this one is feeding on cockroach on the cave. And then uh, another one. So this is what we call as uh, leaf cleaning. So basically they are feeding aphids and other insects from the foliage. Uh, also not a big surprise since this behavior has been done in, has been observed in other species of bubbler, but still a new information since we never know this behavior from these birds before. So you can see that it's just plucking some insect from the leaf. Okay, carry on. Um, now about the threat and conservation. So we also some from threats that we found during expeditions. Uh, it ranged from poaching to habitat destructions, as you can see in the pictures on the right. Uh, this is what they call a flying stick, I think. So basically they put uh, glue on the end of the stick and they put it high up on the canopies. They set up the playback. The poacher set up the playback the, uh, basically to lure in some birds. And when they perch on the stick, the birds got, uh, they, 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 they stick due to the glue and they can uh, harvest the bird later on. Uh, so that's one example of the tweet that we found. Uh, but I will suggest subjectively, and I need to emphasize this word subjectively, said that this tweet may have been 
are not very great impact on the total populations, probably because um, from the poaching side, we do not have any evidence that the poacher are targeting this bird. And we also did not find any particular demon for the market. So we do some uh, bird market survey as well. Basically, we visit some bird market and bird shops around the uh, South Kalimantan and see if they actually sell the bubblers or they're actually offering the bubblers. And we did not find any. Uh, in fact, most of the people that we encountered around the bubblers area and in South Kalimantan in general doesn't even know about the bubblers, despite the news that uh, broke up after its uh, discovery, which could be a good thing or which could be a bad thing. Um, the habitat destruction, we saw some uh, some illegal logging happening. Uh, so some of the area where the bubbler was seen was actually uh, a protected forest. Uh, hutan lindung, which means uh, it's being protected by it under the provincial provincial government. Uh, but basically, there is not much uh, habitat destru destructions happening in large scale apart from mining. Uh, the habitat on the lowland is mostly destroyed by oil palm plantation, but the hill forest where the bubble lives mostly are mostly spared due to its being not suitable for any plantation. Um, so mining for minerals may be problematic in the future, but so far it's only affect a tiny part of this bird range and might take a while for uh, the mining to expand to the other part of the, the places where we find the bubblers. Uh, moreover, uh, however, with the relatively tiny range of this bubbler, which also su probably suggests a small population, um, I think it will be too fast to say that the bubbler are safe from extinctions. Because um, every tiny little uh, disturbance may actually affect the whole population as a whole. So um, I will say that more research is still needed to quantify all these tweets and its connection to the sustainability of the bubbles populations. And we probably need it as EPI before something bad happening to the whole population. So what's next? Uh, what, what's next? Uh, well, as I said before that, uh, our findings show how this bird may be extremely endemic to the coast formation as in South Kalimantan. But from what we heard from uh, there are similar habitat that might still they make access on the herd of East Kalimantan, which is slightly to the north of South Kalimantan, which we are not able to explore yet due to uh, time constraint. Uh, but if the population proven to exist in this area, it will greatly uh, as I once again, greatly expands the range of this bird, which might consequently affect the uh, classification of this species threatened status as well. I also explain how our expedition attempt to quantify this population using distance sampling is it's not really possible at the moment, but it might be possible if we use more advanced uh, passive acoustic monitoring system, which can detect the exact location of each bird, so we can actually quantify the density of this bird which my, we or other people may actually do in the, some, some, somewhere in the future. Um, and obviously we need uh, to determine the species status. Um, so IUCN or scientists need to determine the, 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 the trinity species status of this bird, um, basically taking it out from data division because it will help us to push future research and conservation projects towards this species. And, also promoting it to be included in the, in the country's protection list. Um, as you know, this is not this bird has not been uh, included in the list of protected species in Indonesia yet. Uh, breeding can also be investigated a bit more using the clue of possible breeding projects that we have provided. Uh, and also there's still some question regarding its taxonomy among other bubbles, uh, like if they actually belongs to the genus Malacocincla or if they're actually in the other genus like Trudinus, which is not my, specialty, so I'll leave it to the taxonomist to do. The point is there are still so many questions unanswered uh, about this species. So I recommend every academics here in Indonesia to continue the research about this amazing species and uh, maybe also try to uh, campaign more about the conservation of the species, especially towards the local government and trying to make sure that the habitat will still exist for the next uh, for, for the future, so uh, we can still see the bubblers and, and just to ensure that the bubbler will not disappear again from our site. Um, I would like to thank all the people listed here, also for uh, Oriental Bird Club and uh, American Bird Conservancy for their funding. 
uh, without the help of these people, will we, these expeditions or the whole publication will not happen uh, without everyone's help. So I think that's it for me. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys the talk. Thank you. And now back to the quiz. Back to quiz. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Panji. So, well, I know we thought we were going to get an exclusive, but wow, to see that duetting pair on video and to hear the song, one of the song types was uh, really fantastic and, uh, and a, a real kind of bonus for everybody on the webinar today. So thank you very much for that. Fascinating stuff. Um, we're going to take some questions, I think, in a second. I'd like to jump in with one question first, Panji. Uh, when pandemic allows travel again, can we travel with backpacker to come and see the bird? Of course, <laughs> please do. <laughs> Um, I mean, like there are several people who already contact us to uh, go to see the birds, and um, of course, you are welcome to go and see the bubbles. Uh, I think at the point we can ensure that you will see the birds, it actually doesn't really that. Once you come to the right location, it will not be that rare. So maybe feel free to come to us once the pandemic is over. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Ding Lee. I know there's a couple of questions in Q&A. Ding Lee, did you want to choose one or two questions to, to put to Panji? Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Yep, there's, uh, there's a couple of questions that have gone into the Q&A box. And uh, for those of you in the audience who have got questions, feel free to put that in the Q&A box. We'll pick them up and uh, either Paul or myself will read out those questions um, and uh, pass it to Panji for him to take on those questions. So I'll take on uh, an easy question first, uh, and this is coming from uh, Desi Ayu Triana, uh, coming in from Indonesia. Uh, she, she asks, um, Panji, I'd like to know how many black brow babblers you and your team saw, uh, and how did you do the bird watching in this limestone landscape? Uh, Panji, we'd like to take on this question first. Sure. Uh, thank you, Echi. Um, I know this. So uh, basically, we, as we already, as I already mentioned in the presentation, we got uh, thirty something. Sorry, I forget a little bit. <laughs> so we got thirty thirty one uh, recent present points. So thirty one uh, sightings. In each sighting, we got about two or one bubblers. So I would say around fifty individuals. And all of these present points are in the different location, obviously. So we always try to avoid getting into the same location once. So every single point that you see in the maps in my presentation is uh, basically uh, each site thing. Uh, so yeah, about 50 individuals, uh, all in the different uh, locations. And um, again, we only, because of the terrain, we only able to uh, visit some of the like, uh, the most accessible habitat in the area. So there could be way more than these 50 individuals in this location. Thank you, Ding Li. Thank you very much, Panji. I think that uh, hit the question right there. Uh, the next question, the next question is a conservation focused question. And this is coming from uh, Everlisa Fisher. Uh, I think uh, Everlisa is interested to know a little bit more about the background of uh, bird hunting in Indonesia. And she asked, um, is the poaching of birds in general and specifically of the babbler prohibited by law in Indonesia? What are your thoughts on this? So thank you, Eva, for the questions. Um, it's, a bit, it's a bit complicated to be honest, like, because um, we have a species protection list. So basically every single species in that protection list is not allowed to be poached, to be hunted, but um, the bubbler particularly is not being listed in, in that um, protection list yet. And that's what we try to promote to, to the government to try to include it in the protection list as a P. Um, so it probably, I will, it prob it's not being illegal right now, but I will not promote you to do, to, to do hunting there. <laughs> So it's not it's not being illegal right now, but we are trying to push it to make it illegal for people to trap this bird. Uh, also, the fact that uh, some of the area where we saw the barber is actually protected forest, which means it's actually not allowed to do any poaching in there. So it, any poaching of any other any any birds or animal in that location. So uh, in that location, it would be currently illegal to do any poaching. 
But uh, in ad in other location, unless we finally manage to push the government to put it in the protection list, then um, unfortunately, it's not illegal yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank in you, more Pancho. general terms, Eva, I think one of the problems is the, the policing within Indonesia. So we know from the wider situation with songbirds, for example, that they're openly available on sale in, in numerous markets across Indonesia and indeed in other countries, even though it's illegal. Um, and it's just a question really of, um, I suppose, changing culture over time, um, the possibilities of, of enforcing law in the short term are, are remote, I would say, because the problem is so large scale and there just aren't the resources available or the political will available to, to make it happen. So it's, uh, it's certainly something that's on ABC's radar and you may know about the Songbirds project. Um, BirdLife, I think Lee can tell us a little bit more about that, but it's, uh, it's a big problem. Um, and the stat that stuck with me recently was that uh, it's entirely possible now there are more birds in cages uh, across Indonesia than there are left in the forests. And that's a problem Asia wide, um, but it's it's a big problem for some birds now. Um, anyway, uh, we must all do what we can to continue to lobby for uh, for improvements on that front. But it is uh, it is an issue. If I could jump in, there's a couple of questions regarding the recording, and just to remind people, if they have questions, put them in the Q and A rather than the chat. I'm picking up some questions in the chat, but they might get missed in there. So um, there's a question from Sun Pinyi asking if we can listen, can we listen to the recordings of the song that are restricted on Xena Canto? Um, because uh, Simpin Yip would like to compare the song to similar jungle babblers in Malaysia. And while we're on that topic, I'll throw another question at you um, from Kesh Singh, which is, could we watch the duetting audio again? Very well, Paul. Can you repeat that? Uh, the second one. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the second one is the second one. one is congratulations on the project. But could you could we watch the duetting audio again? Okay, uh, let me share the screen once more. And you mentioned that we are we are privileged to have this being the first um, um, we're the privileged first people to, to hear this recording so uh, well I'll stop now. Yeah it is an amazing recording and, and I'm sorry to talk over it. Um, there is a an issue with um, whether we publicize this recording whether we put it on Xeno Canto. Uh, of course, for birders, there are lots of, and for scientists, there are lots of perfectly good reasons why we might want to put it out there. Unfortunately, for bird trappers, uh, there are also some very bad reasons why we would not want to put it out there. So we are in discussion at the moment about what we'll do on YouTube. Um, we don't really want to have um, a, a good quality recording available for people just to download themselves or re-record off YouTube. So we probably won't put it on the um, YouTube recording of this webinar, and we're unlikely in the present time to put it on Zeno Canto. Once we know if it is a situation where we're sure it's safe to do so, then we'll put it out there. But um, there is obviously, and Panji's are very aware of this too, a responsibility yeah. to the to the bird having just been rediscovered. Um, yeah. As as its fame grows locally, we need to help to manage that process and make sure it's all for good. Yeah, yeah, on that topic, um, it also actually answer one of the questions that I see here from Mr. Nigel Kohler. Um, so that's one of the steps that we took in order to not make the to make not to not make the bubblers um, being trapped. So we, uh, as being described by by Quiz, we we don't publicly share the uh, recordings. Um, in Seno Canto is currently being uh, restricted and uh, in, in, in this uh, presentations, it will be uh, deleted from the recordings later on. And um, also from the maps that uh, we show earlier, um, it actually doesn't really show the, 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 the real points of the, of the bubble. It just show the general area of where the bubble live, but uh, it basically, live in a quite big 
it's it's, it's hardly it's probably I, I hardly end the mix to that area, but um, uh, we don't we try to minimize uh, showing the uh, people about the specific specific location of where it lives because of uh, the, the trappers and poachers. Sorry to interrupt you, Chris. I think I think that addresses also Nigel's question. Uh, and yeah. Nigel has uh, posted a comment here. He says, "Congratulations to Panji on the fabulous talk. Yeah. Really great story and super few work." Um, so I think he might. Uh, he said that he's got to take a phone call, so he, he might miss a little bit of the mm. presentation. Uh, there's a couple of comments and questions coming from uh, from friends from within Indonesia. I think there's hi coming in from Haryadi, from Jihad, and from Rudy. Um, I'd like to combine the questions of Jihad and Rudy. I think they are linked questions. I think Jihad has asked whether um, if there are any current conservation activities uh, on site and if any of the locations that you found are overlapping with protected areas. And Rudy is keen to know if you plan to eventually expand your work to Sangkulirang in the eastern part of uh, Borneo. What, what are your thoughts on this, Panji? Okay, thank you, Dingli. So first question from Mas Jihad. Um, so we did not see any particular conservation activities towards the birds. Uh, there are several conservation NGO working on the area, but um, unfortunately we were not able to uh, get any more information about that. Uh, but generally the sum of the area where the bubblers were seen was protected as uh, Hutang Lindung, which is under the provincial government. Um, so some of them actually being protected, but um, I did not find any conservation uh, activities for particularly for the birds. There are some research uh, which uh, that they have been done uh, by uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Mas Maulana Khalid Rivani, from uh, which is nearby the location where the bubble were seen. Uh, but particularly for conservation, I Maybe they are, but we haven't heard any of them uh, currently yet. Uh, from Pak Udi, Pak Udi Udianto. Um, so that's one of the places that we are. We, we suspect that probably the bubbler also exists in East Kalimantan, Sangkulerang Karst. So there's an extensive karst formation in the area, uh, which sadly we cannot uh, visit at the moment. But uh, we would like to go there as well. Uh, it could be us, it could be other organization, but we just try to point out that this, there could be some uh, possibilities that the bubble exists there as well. And uh, it will be an interesting thing to study once the, once the opportunity arises, we probably will go there to, uh, up to investigate the location as well. Thank you, Ding Li. Thank you, thank you. I think that was a, uh, really comprehensive. I, I'm not sure if we have enough time, but I think we should, uh we should be able to take one or two more questions. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few questions that are linked. So what I'm going to do is to try to combine them together because um, um, they're quite related on many fronts. So there's a, I know that there's a question coming in from Cicely Fiennes and from Mas Asman. Uh, and then in the chat box, there's also another com uh, question coming in from uh, Mas Poli. So I just will try my best to synthesize these three questions into one and you can take on them simultaneously. So Cecily is asking um, whether if it's possible, uh, uh, is there any possibility if um, there's uh, if there's any ownership without knowledge by the scientific community that it has been in the past confused with other babbler species? Uh, second part of her question, um, um, she would like to know whether if uh, given the lack of accessibility to the sites that the babbler is found in and its occurrence in shops in uh, Indonesian Borneo, whether it's safe to say that it has never been trapped and sold before. Uh, I think this also in line with a question that uh, Mas Asman has asked. Uh, he, he would like to know, uh, as well as uh, Mas Poli, whether um, there's any attention from the government uh, on the species, especially the relevant government agencies like BK as they are. Um, what do you think, Panji? Okay, so first question from Cecily. Um, so I think one of the reasons why this species has been missing is just simply there is no people who visit the area before. I mean, like, um, I forget to put the, the, the general uh, pictures of the area, but it's basically very rugged limestone hill. It's just like big walls with the forest on the top with uh, seemingly no tracks to go up there. So um, if 
if I'm a birder or a scientist and I don't know if there is a rare bird up there, which is a black bell bubble or anything, I don't think I ever want to go there and do birder because and do birding because or do any research because it's just so difficult to 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 reach the location. So that's one example. The other is um there are several uh research done in this area as well, but um it's given our inability to well the fact that this bird is just very shy from the beginning, which is the typical of all the bubbler species, and the fact that we do not know how this sounds like before, which is one of the most important characteristics to identify the bubblers, I think we can safely, point, uh, we can safely assume that probably some of the researchers just missing out the bubblers because they simply didn't see it because they're shy or they, see, they hear it, but they cannot recognize it because we never know how it sounds like before, so that's one thing. Um, and about the in this the, about this the, the the shops in Kalimantan. So I would like to 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 I would like to say that there is no such a thing as inaccessible for poachers and bird trappers in Indonesia. I mean, I've seen several weird birds have been uh, traded in 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 Indonesia. So I, as I mentioned before, we also do some uh, bird market. Uh, survey uh, around South Kalimantan are there are quite a lot of species endemic species to Borneo being traded there uh, but luckily we don't we didn't see any black bar bubbler being traded during our survey and most of the people that we uh, interview in their shops also never know about black bar bubblers or where they are, we don't provide them location. Like, do you see any this, this bird in this location? So I just ask them, do you know this bird? Um, and they now they say yes, no, I don't know this bird. I show them pictures and they don't know the, the bird. So, uh, so I think it's safe to say that it never made it to the marketplace. Um, and then for a question from Mas Asman and also uh, Bang Poli, uh, BKS there or the nature. Natural Research Agency in South Kalimantan uh, helped me on this uh, uh, this expedition a lot. So basically, uh, they also sent a team together with me to uh, to do the surveys, and uh, they also uh, so one of the talk that I did with the head of the BKS di Kalimantan Selatan is that they want to encourage the provincial government to make the area there into some. I forget the terms, but basically a special conservation area for the bubblers, specifically for the bubblers, uh, because it could be, uh, please correct me for this, but it, this could be the first endemic species of bird in Kalimantan. I mean, we got many endemic species in Borneo, which we share with Malaysia and, and Brunei, but we never have any endemic species from Kalimantan, which is only the Indonesian territory. So this could be the first Kalimantan endemic species, and they want to encourage the provincial government to uh, make some special arrangement for the habitat to be conserved in, in special ways. Um, so yeah, they help us a lot during the expedition, and um, in the future, they also plan to uh, do more work on conserving these species, which I'm very grateful to them. Back to Dingli. Thanks, thanks, Banji. Yeah, and also a uh, huge thanks to the audience for throwing in so many of these uh, questions that have allowed us to cover every aspect of the species uh, ecology and conservation. I think I'll try to take one more question before I pass the floor back to, to Chris to conclude today's session. And this is a question on the bird's ecology. I don't think we've talked that much about the bird's ecology so far. Uh, here's a question coming from uh, Liu Zhong Zhuang um, asking about the behavior of the black crop babbler. He's really keen to know if you've observed or you think there may be any seasonal movements uh, the babbler might do uh, and whether you've, uh, you've seen it in uh, mixed feeding flocks with other species of uh, mm -hmm. forest birds. Okay, thank you. Um, so I don't think we are, with the current knowledge that we have uh, and with the methods that we do doing our um, short amount of expeditions, we don't, we don't think we're able to uh, confirm if there is any movement, uh, any any seasonal movement or something like that. So um, it's up for the for everyone here to make be interested to do some research about the seasonal movement of the bubblers. Feel free to come and and do the research. Um, so 
but the other thing is uh, as i already mentioned in the presentation we never see them uh, in the in the mixed flock so um which is i think it's quite typical of other malacocking club bubblers they rarely join um uh other other species of bird in the mixed species flocks please correct me on this if if if, if it's wrong but uh basically that's what we found with the bubblers they never join the flocks and probably the same with the other Malacca King Club bubblers. Thank you, Dingli. Thanks, thanks, Banji. Thanks, I think you addressed the question well. Um, I note that Paul want to add a comment on conservation of the species. So I would like to pass the floor over to Paul. Uh, to yeah, make thank a you, comment. Yeah. So there's a question from Simon Rye. Uh, which other species do we want to search for? I'm not sure whether this is directly for Panji or for OBC, but from OBC size, um, as I mentioned, my last point on my presentation, uh, we, we do like to support projects for really poorly known species. And one project we've got at the moment is for the Cebu flower pecker in Philippines, which hasn't been decently recorded for, for many a year. And we're currently also funding a project for the Java and blue banded kingfisher, um, which is, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not very well known, um, bird life. Uh, seems to indicate that its status might may be improved based upon more survey work being done for it um, to get a better understanding of its its status. So funding project for that. Um, another bird that we have high on our list is the Madanga uh, pipit, um, which again hasn't been uh, recorded for a number of years, and there's a lot of interest within OBC to see something happen on that. Um, the list could probably go on, but I'll stop there for the moment. Um, and I don't uh, know, if, and Panji, if you if you have any other interest uh, in, <laughs> or some ideas yeah, there's of other species that you want to mm -hmm. chase. There is actually one species from Sumatra. Uh, I think most of the audience here know about the Ruex blue flag hairs. Um, so. Spoiler alert, one of my friend may actually found, I think it has been um <laughs> it has been publicized in uh I, I forget which journal, but uh, basically somebody found one of my friend found this works blue flag hairs somewhere in, in in Sumatra and uh but they were not able to uh confirm its ID because of its uh similarity to the uh white health blue flag hairs and they are planning to go there to confirm the ID. So that's one. Uh, of the missing species that probably we're going to be now soon. We're going to rediscover soon. Um, they, are, they are still planning to do it, uh, currently looking for funding. So Paul, please. <laughs> so um, that's one one of the species that we that I think we'll, we will be able to rediscover soon. I don't know, maybe Javan Lapwing. I really hope to see Javan Lapwing somewhere in the future. Maybe they are extinct, maybe they are not. But uh, there's always possibility to find that might be somewhere in the remote area of Java that we never visited before. The thing is, we will not be able to find any of these birds if there is no people looking for them. So um, if you, if everyone, if every the audience here know at least one single species of missing, missing species of birds in your area, uh, maybe just try to go birding a little bit more and especially to the, to the area that you never visited before. And it could be a change, who knows? So yeah, just keep exploring, guys, and hopefully we'll we'll find more missing species soon. Thank you. Well, on that note, uh, we're a little over time, so I'd like to uh, say thank you very much to Panji for a fantastic talk. Uh, we definitely want to book you again, Panji, when you've refound Ruex blue flycatcher, and I'd like to see it as well, please. Um, there's another unknown Sionis, I think, in the south in Bukit Baris and Salatan as well, which has never been really been resolved. So definitely lots of other stuff, and indeed. Um, as Panji is fond of saying, spoiler alert, the next seminar, we, uh, webinar we're planning is going to deal with some of these lost birds of the region. Um, so uh, watch this space. That will be a fascinating talk, I think, with the um, discussion, presentation of a number of, of missing species. There's one question that we haven't dealt with uh, here, which is, could one of the pictures be included in Cornell Labs Birds of the World? Uh, we'll have a chat with Panji afterwards. As you probably know, the OBI, the Oriental Bird Club's image, um, database is now managed by um, Cornell so uh, certainly as far as OBC is concerned if we if Panji and the guys are happy for their images to be used then yes they could be on Cornell. Um, on that note once again Panji thanks to you. Uh, 
please do join OBC if you're not a member, orientalbirdclub.org forward slash join, and please do donate. Even five pounds or 10 pounds can make a big difference, five euros, 10 euros to OBC's work. You can just do that right now at orientalbirdclub.org forward slash donate. Uh, and there's a donate button there, very easy to follow. So thanks again, Panji. Um, I think that's all for today. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's been a lot of fun as usual. Uh, probably April will be the next webinar, as I say, when we'll be looking at uh, more lost birds uh, and some more fascinating discussions to come. Uh, panelists, please stay on. Uh, we have a couple of things to do after this, but for everybody else, thank you for joining us and we'll see you soon. Thanks again.